Alexander Rosenberg is a Philadelphia-based artist, educator, writer, and glassblower. In 2018, he was cast on the Netflix series Blown Away that turned up the heat on glassblowing challenges and pushed him to creative extremes. He has a Master's of Science in Visual Studies from MIT and has been an instructor at the University of Arts in Philadelphia. He was named the 2020 Stephen Proctor Fellow at the Australian National University School of Art in Canberra and the recipient of the 2012 International Glass Prize. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for inviting me here, and I want to thank everybody that's tuning in for watching. This is my favorite way to have people experience the, the work and the projects. Like, I love having an art show that you come see. Um, I love having you, you know, like see, see my work in a TV show or see it online. But my favorite thing is to kind of tell you uh, some of the stories behind the projects. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to go a little bit through um, kind of a, a lot of projects that I did leading up to going on to glass blowing on reality TV. And then I am going to talk about the projects that I did um, on, on reality TV. Um, but I love, I love showing this image of these, this kind of classic looking clear glasses that I've made to start off with uh, to talk a little bit about how I describe what I do. I like to talk about myself as a multidisciplinary artist with a studio practice based in glass. Now that's kind of a mouthful for like a guy who makes uh, cups and bowls and stuff. But I really like the term uh, practice around this work because it kind of means two things. Um, on one hand, glass blowing it takes a lot of repetition and doing it over and over and over again to keep up with it. In some ways, it's it's has more in common with being like uh, a professional athlete or musician than other kinds of art forms. Um, but then there's this kind of repetitive way of thinking, this constant checking back in with a single material that influences the way that you see other materials and processes and disciplines in the world. Those are kind of the two, the two things I think that are important to me um, about doing this stuff. Uh, these objects in particular, I don't really feel much ownership over them. It's more me looking at things that I've seen that were made in the past and trying to imitate them. And there's another thing that's really exciting to me about that. Um, if you think about it, glass blowing is a literal recording of physical movement, right? And if I find something like this that's in a museum cabinet or on the page of a book, and I recreate it perfectly, I'm reenacting a series of movements that some maker, otherwise unknowable, has done um, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of years before. And, and for me, this impossible connection to somebody that I couldn't have otherwise known in the past um, is kind of at the root of my interest in the material. So talking about that, talking about connections through the past, um, a lot of my questions, a lot of my projects start with um, kind of a simple question or coincidence. Uh, in this case, I went to the Fogg Museum in Boston, and I found this engraving of Benjamin Franklin. And you can see he's uh, depicted in a funny looking fur hat. And so I just wanted to know why is he wearing this funny looking fur hat? It turns out that when Ben Franklin went on a visit to Paris in the 1770s, they, they already knew him. He was like a celebrity. They knew, they, knew, uh, he, they knew who he was before he arrived. And the artist wanted to connect him to another enlightened thinker, the philosopher Rousseau. And you can see him here depicted in tr traditional Armenian costume. He had this big fur hat on. So when the artist made this engraving of Ben Franklin, they were like, he's an enlightened thinker also. We're going to put him in a similar full hat fur hat, then he'll, you know, then he'll be enlightened. Um, and so I decided that if being enlightened was as simple as being depicted in a fur hat, that uh, I should make one of me. <laughs> so thank you for laughing at that. Um, so I made this image uh, using Photoshop on a train, and I sent it to a factory in China that specializes in making oil paintings that can do, it's really a high level of craft, you know. Um, and the bread and butter, I think, of the time was making like novelty paintings, like, um, you know, a monkey smoking a cigar that looks like banana or like dogs playing poker. But you could send them like a Renoir and get back a Renoir, like very, very highly skilled people. So I had this made into a real paint, uh, a real painting. and. 
I hung it in a gallery uh, and there was a teeny tiny hole cut in one of the eyeballs of the painting and a tiny surveillance camera behind it. And so each time a person went to look at the painting, they themselves would be uh, superimposed onto this monitor underneath another fur hat, kind of being unwittingly enlightened themselves, if that's possible. This is another kind of uh, serendipitous project. I was uh, walking around, uh, I was walking around Somerville, Massachusetts. I was in grad school at the time. And I found this, this house on the street that was radially symmetric. And again, like thinking back to that first slide and just like making glass all the time every day, it changes the way you see the world. So I saw this, this house that was radially symmetric. And I said, maybe this would be the kind of house a glassmaker would, would make. You know, I'm concerned with keeping things on center and spinning them and having them be radially symmetric. So um, looking into it, it was not made uh, by a glass blower, but serendipitously, the, the guy who built the house was actually involved in the glass industry, early American glass industry. He had his name on one of the patents for the glass press, which is kind of America's contribution, you know, biggest contribution to glass industry. Um, he was also a hardware manufacturer. His name was Enoch Robinson. He had patents for like how to attach a, a glass ball onto a doorknob and stuff like that. But the thing about Enoch Robinson was the more that I looked over his, his life, you know, through these, these archives and notes, um, the more I saw that he had this kind of practical day life and this really avid fantasy life. And he dreamed of going uh, overseas to, to Europe to kind of that same time that I was interested in when Ben Franklin was, go was going over. He was interested in that same cast of characters. And he was particularly interested in these um, kind of beautiful pleasure gardens that you know royalty and very, very high up people would show up to and kind of wander around. He, you could see this is one of the only uh, archival images of the inside of his house. He had these scenic wallpapers made that depicted the types of places that he wanted to go. This is um, what he based his house on. It's called, it's called a folly. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but it's kind of a manufactured ruin in this sense, like an architectural folly. It's called the Broken Column House in a, a garden called Desert de Retz in, in, in France. And it's made to look like a crumbling column from some giant civilization that you know w disappeared long ago, and this is the only thing remaining. Um, so I kind of I don't know. I resonate with this idea of of longing for for a, a time and a place that you can't physically connect to, and I wanted to make a monument of that longing for um, for this guy Enoch Robinson. So this is kind of my attempt at that. I made um, it's a small installation, a very teeny room. And I made a glass model of his house. Uh, the glass is made such that the, the architectural detail is engraved into the surface of the glass and it's filled with a, an enamel that makes it very dark. Um, and then I got somebody to physically go, uh, thank you internet, I got somebody to physically go to the real broken column house and take a photograph out one of the windows. And using that archival image of the wallpaper of the inside of his house, I created a collage of what that view looked like. And all this stuff goes together um, in this tiny room and it's shown in complete darkness and people go into the room and you stand there and you wait and you wait and you wait. And then eventually this happens. Um, there's a flash of light from the center of this model and it inverts, you know, where, where at once you were outside of a model looking in, suddenly you're kind of in an architectural size space looking out. That little window lines up with that architectural detail. So in my mind, it's as if you're transported to that site that he wanted to go to and able to see the view for a second. Now, the other thing about this is the flash happens really, really briefly. Um, and this phenomenon called after image occurs. And so this is if you've ever sat in a dark room and uh, set off the flash of a camera, for example, and you can close your eyes and see the image of the room burned onto your retina te temporarily. So that's what happens. Everybody stands in that space. They get this image temporarily burned into their retinas. Um, and they can close their eyes and all see the same thing, which, which again, in my mind, it's a little kind of, it's a little bit of a stretch, but it's like people sharing the same vision or a dream. So another thing that's kind of fun about glass making as a career is uh, you get invited places and they want you to do glass. And I'm always excited by that space, that like built-in performance space. And I'm trying to, I'm always trying to figure out like something I can do with that other than just show up and do the thing. Um, so in this case, I wondered 
what would it be like if making glass made a song? Um, this interface, does anybody here recognize this? You just like hands? Okay, no, this is, not, this is how long ago I've done this. If you were like a cool VJ in the early 2000s, you might have used this. It's called Max MSP, and it's like a simple visual programming language for people. Or it's a program for people that don't want to program, basically. Um, what, what you're seeing is I have a, a, a webcam hooked up to this um, kind of c color filtration thing, and it's following certain pixels in the frame. And those pixels go to corresponding x, y coordinates, and those go to notes on a piano keyboard. There's a little compression in there to keep it in the audible spectrum. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so you're going to hear a little bit. I apologize. You're going to have to hear for a little bit what that sounds like. Um, it's just me making a cup. And it's, it's specifically trying to follow the pixels that are my hands moving through the, the frame. If this was a little bit louder, you'd be asking me to stop. So um, the next step was wondering what that would look like written out as musical notation. And I found this, uh, these people that were making software that was good at listening, listening to those notes and turning it into notation. And so at kind of regular um, playable scale, this ended up being something that was about uh, 10 feet tall by four feet wide. Um, I've never shown it in a place that had a ceiling high enough for it. And you can see, I don't know if anybody here plays, but you can see it's kind of complicated. <laughs> um, I, have a, I had a recent student in a glass class who's a kind of experimental saxophonist, and he's, he's promised that he has a, a band that's gonna perform this for me, which is very exciting. Um, but uh, the thing to me that's exciting about this, even though it is like a little bit of a, a reach, is that this tiny, simple object contained all of that extremely complex information. And of course, like the next step for me would be, can you reverse engineer that? Like, can you play that cup into existence by performing that piece? Maybe we'll see when the guy gets his band together. Um, so thinking more about, I don't know, I think kind of mapping uh, different systems onto one another. And, and this is also, I think, like an inherently glassy thought. Um, when, when you're an artist uh, and you're trying to get people to come into your studio, you have to bribe them. Um, and so you should always have like snacks and drinks and things like that, uh, especially in the summertime in Philadelphia, it's hot. So I was having a lot of citrus fruit around when I was inviting people into my space. And I started noticing that when people would come, they would peel an orange, each, each person would peel an orange differently. Um, and I was thinking about, I don't really remember why, but I was thinking about maps and, and how just different ways mathematically to unroll uh, the surface of a sphere. That kind of comes from, from glass, like thinking about the skin of something, something going from uh, two-dimensional to three-dimensional. There's a lot of like wrapping things up, make, making kind of a surface. Uh, so I started noticing the shapes that people would leave their uh, orange peels in, and I thought, that's kind of complicated math that they're doing. You know, usually it's, it's named after somebody, right? Like if you see the Mercator projection, and that's like, very distorted in certain ways, but it's made to, um, to show you know, trade uh, routes accurately. That's named for somebody that, that did that kind of math. So um, I made these, I was trying to figure out how to get the continents onto the oranges. Uh, and I made this set of brands and you heat them up and you can, um, you can kind of brand the continents into the, into the oranges. Um, and I started collecting them. It turns out there are three ways to peel an orange according to my taxonomy. There's the spiral, the blossom, and the screw it, you know, like rip it to shreds, you know? Um, and I have representations of all of that across many different disciplines. Um, so I collected enough of them that it was time to build this, it's basically like a, a map cabinet. I, I would collect them and, and dry them and, and they're, they're categorized in different ways based on the um, vocation uh, of the person making them. All right, so we're getting closer to, to present. Um, 
Again, thinking about this idea of practice, right? Going back to something over and over again, it makes a lot of stuff. Like I just make a lot of glass, even though some of these projects don't have that much of the material in them, there's this thing going on in the background and, and I'm making all this. And um, one year I decided I'd like to know what that looks like. So I just saved everything. I just saved everything that I made for a year. Demonstrations, uh, I was teaching a lot this, this time. And I was just kind of playing around with it in my studio. And finally, there, there was kind of a spotlight on it. I noticed a shadow and I was like, oh, I can, I can make a shadow by arranging these things. And I started arranging the, the glass until it was my portrait uh, reclining. But it felt too, um, too kind of self-aggrandizing or, or just like serious. I don't know, it didn't, it didn't seem right for, for, for what I was trying to talk about. And there's also this funny um, subtext of this like super kind of macho shop culture around glass making. And it was really on my mind, especially teaching like trying to remove some of that from, from that kind of environment. Um, I wanted to kind of poke fun at that. So I'm looking through my own things. This was a time where I think I was the only person in my family that had a really, like a really stable place to live. So I got a bunch of boxes of stuff and I was going through, uh, a journal and I was, I, my family took me to Venice when I was a kid and I saw this, and I think I was 10 or 11 and I saw this sculpture by Marino Moroni called Angel of the City. And as, as a kid, I was kind of like embarrassed and also curious looking at it. You can probably guess why. Um, this was commissioned in 1947 by Peggy Guggenheim. And it was, it was like super controversial at the time. And the, the 1947 people were like, ooh, I don't think we can have this in the museum. So the compromise, because it's out, it's out in the steps, it's in public, was that they decided to make the phallus removable. Um, it, was, it could be unscrewed. And depending on who was coming to the museum that day, take it off, you know, put it under the desk, wait until a more appropriate audience was coming. You can see there were, there were problems. I visited it recently. There, there were problems with it getting stolen, so it was welded on permanently. But, you know, again, in my kind of stupid mind, I was like, well, what's the cutoff for, like, who gets it and who doesn't, you know? And then shouldn't there be, like, different sizes for different visitors and different, you know? Like, so anyway, I've, uh, oh, and that's the back. I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, so I figured out how to finish my project. Um, and you can see there's, there's all, this, uh, all this kind of glass laid out, and there's an overhead projector that's littered with the sketches that was used to make the stuff. Um, and there's a little uh, pencil left on the sketches. And this was, shown, um, this was shown in a cool museum in Belgium called Glasenhaus as part of a group show. And it won, uh, a pri it won something called the 2012 International Glass Prize. And um, it was the job of the people in the museum every day to see who was coming and adjust like the size and orientation of the pencil. Um, but when the prize, uh, when, I, when they won the prize, Part of it was they were supposed to, the museum was gonna acquire the work and they kind of took me aside and they were like, would it be okay if we just like gave you a check and didn't keep the work? And I was like, yeah, okay. So I sent it to um, another museum uh, in Europe and then at the end of the exhibition, people were given a card when they came in and they could bring the card back. It would give them free admission on the last day of the exhibition. Each person could come in and take one of the glasses away until all that was left was like the big uh, errant shadow. Um, this one, it's, sometimes I like seeing the secret lives of artwork between how it's exhibited. There's a photographer called Louise Lawler who does this. Um, and I love seeing like some, some of the way that stuff just gets packed is really beautiful. I love shipping crates. I used to like take them out of the museum dumpster and try to make stuff out of them a long time ago. Um, so I made this series of glasses that instead of, so, so glass has a lot of stress. It contracts as it cools down to room temperature and different thicknesses cool at different rates. And those, those kind of differences in the contraction cause a lot of stress. Uh, so we have to do what's called annealing the glass. It's like we bring it down slowly in, in an oven that allows those different parts to kind of equalize and, and slowly get down to room, te room temperature. Um, this glass, I didn't allow it to do that. When it was done and it was at this annealing temperature, which is about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I just dropped it in water. And dropping it in the water, it fragments the surface of the glass, but it also contracts it such that 
it's like puzzle pieces held together mechanically, it like sucks it in. And there's actually, it's like a keystone in an arch, like they stay. So I made these glasses and they're made in this way, but once you introduce a little bit of uh, strain to them, they will start to crumble. Like once you take one chip out, like the whole thing kind of, it's like taking the keystone out of an arch, they fall apart. Um, so this was for an exhibition in Virginia and I made this, this, cate, uh, this crate where they're cavity packed in foam. The front side of the, 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 of the crate is made out of plexi and the idea, it's like an egg drop basically. The idea is that it can never be taken out of the, cate, the, the crate it gets like shipped from place to place and you, you kind of display the way that the pieces degrade over time. This one is about um, kind of equivocality and trying to make stuff perfect. It's, um, I'm, I'm really interested in music and instruments specifically and, and this is a one note piano. It's, um, it's called Almost Middle C and it's made by taking a hundred year old upright grand piano and just chopping everything off except for the very center of it and the guts of it work, and then dangling from, uh, from the strings that used to produce the note is a handmade glass that's like as close as I could make to the note that those strings play. The thing that kind of prompted it was that at that place on the piano keyboard, when the hammer hits a string, it's, it's not one string, it's three strings, and one's a little flat, one's a little sharp, one's dead on, like that's what kind of sounds right to the human ear. When I was pulling apart that really old uh, piano that had pl been played for a long time, it was disgusting. I pulled up the um, keyboard and there was just like uh, human grossness, like fingernail clippings and hair and like little dust and things like that. And I was getting ready to take the shop back and get rid of it. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's valuable. Like you can only produce that by playing a piano for 103 years. Um, so I made this, there's a, a piece of glass from the 17th century, there's actually two of them in the collection at Corning Museum that are, that are reliquaries and they, they contain like little bits of, of skin and uh, bone fragments from a um, person of historic religious significance. And I made this design based on that and I put all that stuff in there. It's just called reliquary. All right, this is participatory. This is called, hold your hands in front of you about eight to 12 inches away from you at eye level. Point your index fingers toward each other, touching at the fingertips. Now look through your fingers into the distance behind them. If you haven't done this before, I suggest you do it right now. If you do it, what you'll see floating between your fingertips is something pretty similar to what's in that image. It's, a, it's an optical illusion. This is like a child's optical illusion, um, but it's produced by having binocular vision. And I wanted to figure out a way to make a photograph of this um, using a, a camera a monocular tool. Um, so this is not photoshopped, it's not altered in any way, it's just like a straight up photograph. And the way that I produced it was with glass, making this object. <laughs> it's kind of gross, I don't know why. Um, we referred to it as the finger turd when it was in my studio, but um, glass has this uh, like great ability to take on different surfaces and it also has this kind of tr tr translucence and um, uh, a reflective quality that's very similar to human skin when it's, treat, uh, when it's treated properly. Um, this one is called Epitaph. It's, it's um, another of these kind of, uh, kind of showcases another really ephemeral quality of glass. The ability to, um, it's also kind of relevant to the shadow thing, but there's, there's this tool that I like to use that makes a tiny little etched mark on the surface of the glass. It's almost invisible to the eye, but it will make a shadow that's visible. And um, this, there's a piece of sheet glass leaning against the wall that's inscribed with text. Uh, the candle burns down, it illuminates one line of text at a time, and it reads what I hope it will read on my tombstone. It says, Alexander Rosenberg, he tried. <laughs> so, um, people at home probably can't hear the laughter. There's laughter. Um, so um, at this point, I'm, I'm living in this, this house. It's like a, a crumbling pile of bricks in Philadelphia in what was at the time kind of an edgy neighborhood. People would try to, um, I live near a, an abandoned coal pa power plant. It's now being turned into like luxury houses, but at the time it was this abandoned pa uh, coal power plant. And the neighborhood's kind of dark and um, you know, my block was like a, a, a block that was popular, like drop uh, stolen abandoned cars with no wheels on them. It was like, uh, it, was, it was a nice dark place to do stuff like that. So I was thinking a lot about um, 
working with public space, trying to bring uh, put light back there. And I made this, uh, this neon heart. Um, it goes up in my window at the top of my house. So you can actually see it from I-95 or from the Delaware River. And I hook it up to me when I sleep at night and it blinks on and off with my heartbeat. So people can kind of, I asked my doctor to look at it with a telescope. She was unwilling to do so. <laughs> This one, I'm not going to spend too long on it because I can kind of talk about it for a while and I really want to make sure that we get to the um, reality TV stuff. But there's some really interesting, uh, I've always been interested in kind of alternative economies. And there's a big um, pipe making scene in glass in general, but in Philadelphia too specifically. And as I was kind of learning more about it, um, I was trying to understand like why there was so much uh, so much money uh, in this particular area. Like people were making these pipes that were fabulously expensive, and there were also a lot of support for these artists to kind of develop this work. Um, and it turns out there was kind of a deeper uh, relationship to some other things. It had to do with the um, as cannabis was becoming legal recreationally, state to state, but not federally. The banks didn't want to take the money and armored cars wouldn't carry it. Um, so there was like this giant cash surplus and to deal with it, like the community created this kind of alternative economy where the bullion uh, was glass pipes. You know, it was something that everybody agreed was valuable uh, that would hold the value for a long time and that they could kind of use to, to store and, and move this money around. Um, and I was super interested in figuring out a way to participate in that alternative economy without necessarily being a pipe maker myself. So I developed this currency um, that I could trade with, with the pipe makers. We would sign this, uh, this legal document that would assign a similar value to the coin that I had made uh, to, to the pipe that they were giving to me. And we would sign this, uh, we'd sign this special contract with this ink that I had made out of uh, canna uh, cannabis oil and cochineal red, which was like the first red. It was a very, uh, very valuable dye. Um, and once we did that, I would trade uh, their pipe for my coin and then I, I was assembling those pipes together to make this super valuable super bong. And I wanted to sell it um, specifically uh, to, to, to help people that were uh, incarcerated, you know, that were still incarcerated for nonviolent uh, cannabis related stuff um, while these kind of big businesses were moving ahead with it. Uh, this is gonna be interesting. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do the videos on this. Um, this one is called, uh, so, so moving forward and getting to do more work with public space, I was, I was really pleased to be part of this project called Monument Lab that asked like, what's the appropriate uh, monument for a contemporary city? And I was uh, given Rittenhouse Square, Square in Philadelphia, which it was a really hard site to work with because it had changed so much, you know, like over time it had been uh, a training ground for revolutionary army. It had been like a place where they just piled waste uh, it had been, there had been like um, uh, a, a, an observatory proposed there that was never made, a parking structure underneath it. There were reports of seeing like this uh, albino deer running around. So I made this alternative, uh, uh, I made this augmented reality interface that goes inside of a coin operated viewer. And you can look through it and see overlaid all of these things that were proposed or changed um, layered on top of the actual site as it was today, kind of as if like time hadn't happened, as if all those things were happening at once. Yeah, I, th I don't think these are going to work. These are 3D videos, so like you can kind of click on it and drag around and see the experience. But I don't know how to click and drag with this uh, with this clicker. So, all right, getting close to now. Um, this is actually pretty recent. I was in Montana, and and again, like uh, thinking about. I'm kind of getting more and more interested in neon, but. Uh, um, I'm also thinking about like how you make a vessel, like how you design a vessel. I was interested in this, um, a French curve, like a, for, for a, basically for making garments of clothing. I made this, this uh, shape derived from the French curve and took it into the, um, into the high desert and just took a long exposure photograph rotating it to become this kind of vessel form. All right. So you remember in that first slide, one of the things that I was talking about was reenacting movement as a way to connect with the past. Um, this, is, uh, this, this project is on view right now at Eastern State Penitentiary, which is in Philadelphia. It's a former penitentiary. It's the first penitentiary. Um, it's a really weird and interesting space. It's a panopticon, which like 
if anybody um, has gone to grad school and had to read Foucault, you've probably read about it, but I'll do my best to kind of uh, explain it. It's, it's, it's an architectural structure that allows a single person to have maximum power over other people um, for fear of being seen. So the, in, in this structure, uh, each one of those spokes from the center is full of uh, cells where people are in solitary confinement. Um, they can't see or hear, they, they can't see one another, but there's a guard, a single guard in the center, and any time you kind of poke your head out, there's the, the kind of the fear that that guard, or the, um, the understanding that that guard could see you, and it kind of puts a lot of control over a large population by a single person. So uh, this, is, this is what it actually looks like. So um, my proposal, this is a place that accepts artist proposals, it's, uh, it's made out of Wissick and Schist, which is the rock that you would climb if you were outdoor uh, climbing in the Philadelphia area. And uh, I'm kind of a hobby climber and I would walk by this place all the time and see the rock and be like, oh, I wanna climb it. And I think a lot about how many people have had that same fantasy, you know, and, and what it would be kind of be like to realize it. So uh, I wanted to put up a bunch of first descents on the outer wall of the, of the prison and make a guidebook out of it, like you would for any kind of natural site. It's also kind of exciting to me that this place is a natural, natural, eh, national historic monument. It's, it's kind of protected and conserved in many similar ways to kind of um, natural sites, you know, that, that, um, that need to be uh, conserved. And it's kind of being a, a, a ruin, it's somewhere between like built and natural in itself. Um, so I did that. You can see that's me on the very bottom in my helmet on the top of the, uh, on the, top of the wall with a nice drone photo. Um, the same year that the, um, that the prison closed, this uh, Chouinard Equipment Catalog was published, which had this essay um, called The Whole Natural Art of Protection, encouraging people to conserve rock in the same way that they were conserving other natural resources. Um, climbers were using pitons and stuff that was kind of damaging and changing the rock, and we wanted to do something different. And so the kind of ethics outlined in that um, essay overlaid really nicely onto some of the concerns of the site as like a, natu a national historic monument. Um, so I made this, this climbing guide. And um, one of the things that I thought was pretty exciting was there were over 100 escapes from this prison during this short time that it was open. And this, um, this is some of the notation that they used to like record how the escape happened. They would draw these little arrows on, on what part of the building people climbed. And so that was kind of my system of notation of like for each one of the climbs to go through the book, it tells you how to go. Um, and then to me, I think one of the most exciting parts was I, I learned uh, from some friends who had been formerly incarcerated how to do some of the, the craft uh, that, that is common uh, in prison to, to make the gear to, to climb on. So there's like bed sheet ropes and different kinds of cams and things that worked in the rock that were all made with kind of technology that would be available to people that were incarcerated at the time. You know what, I'm actually just gonna skip this one. We're gonna get right into the stuff. Okay. Um, so, I didn't talk a lot about what was going on in the background of all this stuff, but um, my career for a long time has been teaching, uh, teaching glass in, in, in kind of a college environment. And um, in the last couple of years, it kind of wasn't working out with the institution that I was in. It, was, I, it seemed like they really weren't committed to glass and, and I kept trying and they, they kind of kept showing me that they weren't committed. So, um, so I finally left and I, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I didn't really have anything lined up. So I just started like applying for everything. Uh, this is what I do when I'm nervous and I feel like I'm, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my mortgage. I, I put a lot of applications out. And one of the things that I applied to looked terrible. It looked like a horrible idea. It was a social media ad with lots of like cheesy flame clip art. Um, it was a glass blowing reality show. Uh, so I put my name out in the hat. Sure enough, um, I got a call from, from the uh, casting director. You know, we went back and forth a few rounds. I got a call from the casting director that was like, yeah, we, you know, we think maybe you should do this thing. And I said, all right, you know, if there's a chance to make money, I will do it. Um, I also like showing this image because it looks like they got the design team from the Fast and the Furious movies for... Um, so, so I went on this series and it was actually like a wonderful experience. Um, I think it's something that I wouldn't have done if I hadn't have been in kind of a desperate place. And it makes me feel grateful to have been a little bit desperate at the time uh, that that was started. So I'm gonna walk through 
some of the things that I made on the first series, then I made some of the things on the, um, I went back for a Christmas special. Um, so this is the very first challenge we got there. Um, the shop had just been built. They hadn't turned it on yet. It was very, very hot. It was very, very challenging to work in the first day, like very hard to stay upright. Um, I decided, they, they, they had made us bring a photo of something that was important to us. And I had a picture of my best friend and my former dog that had died. Um, and then they said they wanted us to make something out of glass that was related to that. So um, again, you remember from the beginning of the talk, I really like, like looking at things from the past. Uh, and I, I was familiar with this vessel called a lacrimatory. It was like a tear collector. Um, ancient Romans may have used it, but I think a lot of it's kind of apocryphal, like what you would see that people call a, a lacrimatory usually isn't. And then the Victorians were kind of interested in that, like antiquity and that idea. Um, so I made kind of my own version of it. The idea is that this little vessel inside, you would, you would cry into it. And when the, the vessel's full, um, a full sphere produces a, lens, a magnifying lens and it would allow you to kind of look closely at a part of the photograph that you had in there. Um, oh, and that one won. It was it won the first challenge, so that was cool. Um, you know, it was I, I still wasn't really sure if I would, was the right person to be there at that point. This is the one that I made for the second one. You were supposed to talk about your favorite, um, you know, make a, a place setting for for a meal that you would really want to have. And I love um, this Vietnamese dish that looks kind of like a crunchy bird's nest, and you put this uh, brown sauce on it, and it kind of it creates this like texture gradient, like it's kind of gooey in the middle and then it gets crunchier and crunchier as it gets to the outside. But I wanted to solve this problem that you can never take it for leftovers because it gets too soggy. So I made this um, like sauce dispersal system, which you can see this object standing there. It's got like three legs are also spouts. And the thing above it is this fragmented glass that I told you about earlier. So you can put this thick sauce in there and it like very slowly kind of disperses into the rest of it. Um, I'm not resentful, but I just want to say the guy that did win this challenge, his stuff was way, like it was held together with spit and chewing gum and that. Sorry, Janusz. But then um, this was tight, that little, uh, that little dish on the bottom, I was like, that's a hard shape to make. And I was like, whew, nailed it. Anyway, um, this one I did not make so well. I wish I could go back and make this one better. But um, it was, uh, and this is kind of related to some of the things that I'm doing in the studio these days. They were asking about, you had to make lighting, and I wanted to make this lighting kind of for Anthropocene, like, uh, you know, for, for kind of environmental um, problems that we can anticipate. So I'm thinking about when, like, resources that we burn for natural electricity, uh, for electricity run out, this would be like you could seamlessly change over, put some candles in there, still keep going, no problem. Uh, this one, they had a uh, sommelier as the guest judge, and um, she hated it. I'll tell you that. But um, I, so I don't, I don't drink. Uh, like I'm in recovery, so my idea of like what makes drinking good is the most possible. So I made the biggest decanter. It's it's pretty huge, and um, I wanted. To, I was thinking about absinthe, and I had seen these these glasses that have this constriction in the bottom. And it's very theatrical, like you pour this bright green liquid and there's like ice and it changes color and the constriction slows it down. It's like uh, an hourglass. So I wanted to make that design. I have these lids that are hourglasses and you pour this in and, and it kind of slowly drips down the side and it makes a lot of noise. But um, like I said, she hated it. Um, this one I thought was like the stupidest thing I've ever made. Um, they, they gave us something small and they wanted to make it big. It was kind of pop art, like Klaus Oldenburg style. And I got this pill bottle and, and I made it and, uh, and the world loved it. And uh, so, I, you know, this was also like one of the first things that really made me like a living after this, like people commissioning this. So I think the moral of the story is in this case, I was the stupid one. Um, this is a collaborative effort with Janusz, who I was kind of uh, poking fun at before. Um, he was a great guy to work with. And they, they asked us to do something about duality, like uh, two, two different sides of a coin. So we had uh, things that were supposed to be heavy that were quite light, and then we had things that were supposed to be light that were quite heavy. And they do this like impossible balancing act in the middle of the room. I will tell you also, we're, we're getting really close to the end, but I will tell you also, um, 
that this was not held together super securely and they left it overnight and it got totally destroyed. You know, they were, they were, uh, they were upset. This one, uh, we were supposed to do something with, with glass flowers and I was looking at the work of my, uh, it was my partner at the time, Elaine, uh, Dr. Elaine Ayers. She writes about this, um, she writes about uh, materials that resist collection, collection uh, particularly in the 19th century. And she, she wrote about this phenomenon called the disappointment of the tropics where like people were going, people would see these glass houses in Europe with everything artificially in bloom. And then they'd go down to the tropics and find stuff like brown and wilting. And it, it was kind of this um, at odds with their expectation of the place. So this is about uh, people would use this mini glass house called a Wardian case to try to bring these very, very delicate f f specimens like orchids back to back to Europe and they rarely made it. It was like, you know, one out of 20 would, would make it back. So the idea of this kind of wilting flowerless uh, plant inside of this vessel. This was the one that, uh, that sent me home, unfortunately. It was, um, uh, they asked us to think about a body in motion. And I was thinking about, um, I was actually thinking about John Cage and, and his like uh, four minutes and 33, like silent performance. He went to, uh, he was around MIT also. And he, the, the story is he was looking for an anechoic chamber to study in. Anechoic chamber is a room that reflects no sound. You've probably seen there's like foam cut out everywhere and you go in and it feels really weird. You're used to having sound to kind of orient yourself in space. So they would go in there, they try to study and they couldn't study because all their internal stuff was too loud. Like they tried to listen, they're hearing, you know, their own heart beating, the sounds of their mouth noise, like the, their hair follicles grow, you know, whatever. Um, so that's where his kind of silent performance came from. And I was thinking about like a body at rest is still moving, right? There's, there's processes inside that go. So this was, um, you spin it and it's kind of an optical illusion. The lungs look like they're getting bigger and smaller. There's big lungs on one side, small on the other. Okay, so um, I went back again, uh, Christmas special. And really quickly, I'm just gonna tell you the things that I made for that. There's the, um, on the right, they asked us about, I'm also Jewish, I don't celebrate Christmas. So it's like when I was invited to do a Christmas special, I thought they were just referring to like a holiday special. And I showed up, it was very Christmassy indeed. So um, they were asking about like, what's the best gift you ever got? Um, I had a, a grandfather who, who I was pretty close with who used to kind of show, show me the stars and planets through a telescope. So I made this um, kind of a model of, of, of an orrery, um, a gla glass model of the solar system. And to the left, they were asking about holiday meals. Um, and you can see, uh, I get invited every year to my best friends. It's, it's called a glug party. It's like a Swedish smorgasbord around Christmas time. And they have this like sour, stinky herring. And I, I wanted to do something kind of, kind of humble. So um, I made this kind of chopped up fish in a jar. Um, and then finally, the, the, the very last one, they were asking us to, to make, you know, kind of design a um, a set of, of Christmas ornaments, which I was, I have to say, I was kind of dreading, but um, I was thinking about sublimation. It's like in really cold, cold places where water goes directly from ice to vapor, no, no liquid in between, in between. And I wanted to kind of make that gradient in, in the tree. And uh, I think you can see these are some examples of the little baubles, but on the top was a part that was exciting to me. It's, uh, it's that glass is unannealed. It's just blown out so very thin that it cools instantly. They didn't go in the kiln. I was just like dropping blobs of glass on a tube of glass and blowing it out really, really hard. And then I made this kind of mechanical structure that sits there like a big uh, vapor bubble. So um, here's a couple more examples of the baubles. And this is how you get in touch with me. We usually would do a, like kind of a Q&A about some of this stuff, but um, if you wanna, if you want to ask me questions and um, you can, the audience here can come up and talk to me in person, but everybody else can, uh, can find me through these things. So thanks for, thanks for listening.